Hello, I'm Ann Behealer. I'm the principal investigator for the National Convergence Technology Center, which is a National Science Foundation grant focusing on information technology, some cybersecurity and communications. Welcome to our presentation entitled IT Skill Standards, Engaging Employers, Defining Skills and Preparing Students. Here are a couple of facts. Uh, educators think our graduates are really very well prepared for work, and sometimes they are. However, in general, businesses don't agree. The percentages do vary, but I will tell you for sure that they don't match. We may think that 96% uh, of us think we're preparing the students well, and maybe only 11% of the businesses agree. Uh, but one thing we can agree on for sure is that both businesses and educators want the graduates to be workforce ready. Why do they want that? Well, of course they want that because they want them to hit the ground running and be productive as soon as they possibly can. The days of having massively long training programs for new hires are over. The businesses need to have their employees be productive much, much faster. Why are skill standards important? Well, first of all, the last time comprehensive skill standards were developed for information technology and cybersecurity was 2003. I think that everyone you talk to will think that as fast as the information technology area moves, it's very likely that those skill standards are way out of date. So what's the purpose of the skill standard in the first place? It's to provide a blueprint of how technical knowledge and skills in the IT high performance workplaces are organized and how the roles of workers contribute to the success of the businesses. We also embrace a future focus. Think about it. If we design curriculum today to focus on today's needs by employers, then we're out of date by the time we get our curriculum developed and understand that the businesses and industries do want to hire students who can integrate products, not just one bit vendor experts. What I mean by that is we now have a lot of vendors that are providing training on their specific products. That's really great, but in general, the businesses want to have students or graduates or new employees who can integrate products, not just um, being experts in a particular vendor's product. Educators use skill standards to create curriculum aligned with business needs, and the project is also creating student learning outcomes based on employer input so that a broader range of educators can better prepare students for the workforce. Employers use skill standards to improve communications about their job openings so that they can hire the most qualified students or graduates to address their current and emerging needs and improve their internal training and development. Now, larger companies take care of this on their own, but the small and medium-sized companies need a little bit of assistance. I can remember being an employer myself in a small firm of about 10 people, and it was quite the challenge to come up with a job description even that would be specific enough for now, but also focus on the future. Skill standards also make IT careers accessible. Most everybody knows that IT and cybersecurity careers are going to be very high wage. However, it's often very difficult for the student who just hasn't learned about information technology and some cybersecurity. It's often very difficult for them to understand what they really need to know to be able to be successful in the job market. So essentially, we're trying to help businesses, educators, and students nationwide by widening the pipeline of qualified IT workers. Now, our purpose in this grant, IT Skill Standards 2020 and Beyond, is to create a contemporary group of future-facing skill standards for the top job clusters that are most difficult for employers to hire at this point in time. And we'll talk a little bit later about how we figured that out. And then once we have those skills clusters or have those job clusters identified, we're enlisting 40 or more subject matter experts for each job cluster to create the knowledge, skills, abilities, tasks, and performance criteria using a modified DACOM process that we'll explain in a few moments as well. The other purpose is to determine which portions of the standards apply to the two-year area and which apply to a four-year area. 
with the advent of a lot of bachelors of applied technology programs, it's very reasonable to think that what has normally been addressed by a community college in a two-year program can possibly be addressed better even or more completely by a bachelor's of applied technology. Oftentimes we have a discussion with the businesses regarding how much can actually be put in a two-year degree and I will allege that in many, many cases, what is needed for an entry-level person to be competitive may extend a little bit beyond a two-year uh, program. The purpose also is to assist the employers and the educators to more easily apply standards. Note that we are using all the existing standards that we know of. However, we're simplifying as we go along as well. So this flowchart actually explains everything that we're doing in this project. I'm not going to expect you to speed read and get all of this right now because we're going to break this down and talk about it as we go along. The first part actually started with recruiting at least 50 employer thought leaders with expertise across the IT area to develop a draft list of the critically needed job clusters in IT. We actually said we would develop eight to 10 of those job clusters, and we worked with them to get the first seven initially. Then after we get the work done with the thought leaders to come up with the job clusters, we actually shipped it out to almost 150 additional companies for their comments on those clusters. We started with information from Burning Glass, similar to what is showing now. We picked about 14 of the most in-demand job clusters to discuss with the thought leaders. And what we did was we came up with the number of postings over the most, most previous six months before the thought leader meetings, and then the number of unfilled jobs in the last six months. In other words, in this particular area, there were almost 57,000 postings, and they have a way of deduplicating these postings as well. However, over 60% of those jobs were actually unfilled at the end of the six months. And then we also looked, and this came, really came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, at the job prospect through 2026, so that we could not only address now, but address mostly the future. So we had four two-hour virtual thought leader meetings that went through information just like what we just showed you for about 14 of the most critical clusters. And you can see the dates of when these were held in 2019. And this is a project that is in high demand, obviously, because we had 98 employers participate from across the nation when our goal was only 50. And after we synthesized the data from the four different meetings, we sent it out for verification to 147 employers and 82 people responded. It, it was very, very high interest. They came to consensus on seven of the 10 job clusters. Those include infrastructure, connectivity, management, and engineering. Think networking plus cloud. Technical support. I was really surprised that there would be a pretty large need in technical support because we have so many knowledge bases available and so much automated response now, I wasn't really sure that was going to rise to the top of the list. However, it did. And one particular CTO actually stated that as long as we have users, we will have a need for tech support. And that's a very good thing, especially for community colleges, because community colleges often use technical support jobs as the first job for their graduates. We also had technical project and program management. The thought leaders were intent on including project and program management. I will give you a little bit of foreshadowing here. The program management portion, uh, after we got really into it, it was decided that that was really beyond the entry level person's uh, area. So they really focused more on project management. Then data management and engineering, think database, the equivalent of database. However, not all the data is kept in databases anymore. So the thought leaders wanted to call it data management and engineering. Then data analytics and predictive modeling. 
Uh, we've talked about that uh, across the nation for the recent years, as that is a very large and growing section of the IT industry. And then software development and security consistently have a large number of job positions that cannot be filled. So let's move on. Once we have the job clusters identified, we are engaging the employer subject matter experts, about 40 of them, to hold their meetings and using our modified DACOM process, they actually go through a list of knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks and prioritize them. And there are multiple meetings in all cases for these clusters. Therefore, we have to synthesize the results of the voting and we also have to analyze the discussion regarding any missing items. At every meeting, it's very, very important that the SMEs vote, but it's also just as important that they discuss the items that are listed. And then we send the synthesized data back out to the subject matter experts by cluster requesting a broader review. And what we have decided to do in this COVID environment on our fourth job cluster grouping we're actually holding a virtual meeting of all the subject matter experts that participated originally to verify what we have created. So what's our status? The face-to-face -face job cluster meetings originally lasted about six hours and there was a working lunch and we voted and discussed employability skills and a lot of the votes up until about March timeframe were done face-to-face -face, and even when we had people on a polycom or a web conference phone, we would have people register their votes, and it was pretty manual. However, our program director, Christina Titus, came up with a way to use Google Sheets and Google Forms that has really streamlined our approach. Rather than the face-to-face -face meeting lasting six hours, it's down to lasting four hours or maybe a little bit less. The infrastructure job cluster discussions were held in four different places, all face-to-face, -face, which is still my ideal, because when people are in a room looking at one another and discussing and perhaps disagreeing about something, they are better able to come to consensus on what they really both believe. But we know in the COVID-19 environment that we have not been able to have face-to-face -face job meetings for a lot of the clusters. Here again, we were able to get technical support and technical project management in before we had to uh, stop traveling. And even data analytics and predictive modeling, we got one face-to-face -face meeting in on March 12th. And that was the last time I actually traveled anywhere. On March 31st, we held a virtual meeting due to COVID and had a large number of people involved in that meeting. Now that works, it's just not quite as easy to uh, communicate, especially on items that need to be added. And to let you know what is still happening in 2020, we are hosting the job cluster meetings for data management and engineering. This is the IT side of managing data, very much like the database management jobs uh, are, although some of the data is not in databases anymore. We also plan to begin hosting software development job cluster meetings as well. By way of update on our web posting, we have posted the infrastructure, technical support, and data analytics draft skill standards, and that actually includes the employability skills and employer demanded key performance indicators. You see the URL there that has this information. Project management draft skill standards with employability skills will be posted by December 2020. Once we get the knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks. Uh, they're to be posted on a website for broader comment. And then we'll uh, incorporate the feedback from there. And anything very conflictory amongst the feedback will be referred back to the subject matter experts. They even well have grown by that point. Also happening this summer or fall, we will be posting the results of the first four clusters on the IT Skill Standards website and the ATE Central websites, and we'll also post the employability skills for the first four clusters. I failed to mention that the employability skills are actually addressed over the working lunch, and we get the folks that are the subject matter experts to tell us what level 
of each of the employability skills are necessary. For example, obviously there's oral communication and written communication. Depending on the particular job cluster, is there a difference in the level of proficiency that would be expected in a workforce ready graduate? Then as when we get to the point that uh, the cluster information has been up on the website for a couple of months, we will have the subject matter experts identify relevant job titles. And we're having the subject matter experts from the educator community convert the KSAs and tasks into student learning outcomes. And also the key performance indicators will be developed. The first of those meetings for KPIs will occur in July of 2020. Also happening this summer and fall, we'll work with educators for the SLOs for those first four clusters. And then the employers and educators will together create the key performance indicators and we'll begin working with the employers on job titles. And finally, once we have eight or 10 of the job clusters analyzed, we will be disseminating the skill standards very, very broadly to industry associations, to colleges, to businesses, to government. And we are developing pilot and um, more sustainable or more traditional policies for keeping these skill standards up to date. And still happening this fall, the skill standards, key performance indicators, employ employability skills that have been published will be made available to our thought leaders are almost 100 thought leaders that were CTOs or CIOs or thought leaders for their companies uh, so that they can comment on them. We're also going to begin creation of how-to documents and how to use videos for the skill standards. And we will begin dissemination through webinars and conference presentations. Now, all of this was built on the BUILT model, the business and industry leadership team model. Some people say that it is, an, in effect, a business advisory council on steroids, but it is foundational for the IT skill standards work. It expects the business and industry people to adopt a co-ownership or a co-leadership role for the program or the job cluster. And it actually works out very well. We've used this process with the CTC, the Convergence Technology Center, for now about 16 years. And it allows us to align curriculum very, very closely with what business wants. Uh, we do have to keep focusing on entry level, entry level, entry level for the employers because they would like to see us handle all of the training from entry level all the way to expert. But that's a little difficult to standardize to uh, get out to all the colleges across the nation. The business team also shares sector trends and forecast labor market demand. And in the meetings that we're having for the skill standards, we're asking for that too, because we want them to add in future knowledge, skills, and abilities as well. And it's a very deep relationship that colleges develop working with a built model. And the ultimate is that the students benefit because they're workforce ready. Works for any technical program in any size of college. There are seven essential elements to the built model. And again, we're not focusing specifically on the built model, but on the built model processes that we have been using as we have developed the IT skill standards. The built is divided by subdiscipline or a specific focus. For example, we're not necessarily having the same person be on the infrastructure team as on the software development team. Possibly the person would be a subject matter expert in both, but we're not assuming that. So we are holding the meeting separately. And you can see in this picture, here's some of the uh, individuals that we have used on our built team for the CTC and how they work together. You can see that they're uh, definitely interacting with one another to come up with the information that we need. Another essential element is that the built needs to be convened more than once a year if you're using it to guide a college program. On ITSS though, really we're pulling them together initially in three different parts of the country face to face, or at least two or three different times for virtual meetings uh, for the purposes of ITSS. 
we are not asking the thought leaders and the subject matter experts to sign on for multi-year commitments, although they're invited to make comment and make suggestion for updating the skill standards as we go along. Oh, back on the previous slide, uh, you'll notice that we have had in-person meetings for years. And if you'll look in the middle of that top picture, there's a web conference phone. And that web conference phone usually has as many people on the line participating as we have in the room. Our work is national and we actually include national people. We just don't necessarily fly them all in. It's important for the BILTs to talk about their perspective on trends and for ITSS, it's a discussion of item, items that might have been left off the KSA list for them to discuss. But it's really, really important for them not only to vote, in other words, don't send it out via email, have them at least synchronously discuss the, the voting and decide what kinds of changes might need to be made in the list of KSAs. Another essential element is inviting faculty to attend BUILT meetings so they can hear firsthand about the trends and job skills. For ITSS though, we have educator SMEs that are invited to join the employer SMEs so that they can actually use the information that is garnered to be able to create the SLOs. On the BUILT model once a year, we do go through the detailed analysis of knowledge, skills, and abilities that the BILT wants to hire in workforce ready graduates 12 to 36 months in the future to give us a bit of time to create curriculum. ITSS does this once and then it will be maintaining the list. We also ask faculty to map the prioritized list of KSAs to current curriculum to make sure it aligns or to address gaps. For ITSS, faculty at the colleges and universities nationally would be trained to map the IT skill standards, the national skill standards to their curriculum and to present results back to their own business teams. And then it's very, very important that we give regular feedback to the BILT regarding what we could do as colleges to implement the recommendations. If you can't do something they want, maybe it's because you don't have enough money for equipment or maybe you don't have trained faculty who can teach the courses, sometimes the BILT can help. But for ITSS, the educators will be taught how to share their feedback with their own BILT teams. That's a little bit beyond what can be done on a national level. Now, how do you select the best employer SMEs? Well, they need to be able to predict their future. They need to pull out their crystal ball and determine the future of IT in the cyber industry. And usually to do that, it requires high-level technical executives CTOs, CIOs, technical strategists, some first line hiring managers, and maybe a few technicians. Um, ITSS only focuses on senior level subject matter experts, but of course it would be good to have uh, everyone from the technician doing the job through that person's manager all the way to the higher level executives on the business team for a college. HR reps are a little bit problematic. They get their information secondhand from the hiring managers. So it's usually a good idea to have someone in addition to the HR representative uh, be on your team for your business team. Now let's talk about sustainability. All National Science Foundation grants are to have at least some of their key efforts sustained after grant funding ends. Even though we're only about halfway through, we have begun the process of sustainability by piloting a crowdsourcing approach to keep the job skills updated. Subject matter experts can apply for permission to comment, they can enter their comments, and then those comments are evaluated every quarter for inclusion or change to these skill standards. Additionally, we have begun seeking industry financial support and leadership to sustain the work as well. It's unreasonable to expect the National Science Foundation to always fund the skill standards. So what can you do? You can sign up, get on our distribution list for skill standards so that you can receive them as they're finalized. You can be one of the educator SMEs for your cluster if you're an expert in a particular cluster or more than one cluster. You can recommend appropriate employer SMEs to come to the meetings or participate in the virtual meetings. And then you can address 
SMEs who may be interested and able to participate in the IT Skills Standards 2020 and Beyond meetings uh, on an ongoing uh, time frame. And if there are any questions, please email the contact people in the Central US Eastern Coast or West Coast for information as appropriate. You may also email Christina Titus, who is our program manager. And below, I will remind you that here is our website with many of your questions already answered. Thank you for participating with us. We appreciate you greatly.